And so I had a computer lab of about 15 to 20 kids. Uh, they're all seniors, right, behind in credits. And so, um, so I sat in this lab, and I was, it was my job just to oversee it and, you know, make sure that the kids were on the right track. There was this one student, though, in the class, one student in the class that was the jokester. And you always have them if you know, um, if you've been in education, you have that one class clown, the one that comes late, especially in high school, the one who just thinks he's cool or she's cool. And uh, so he comes in, and, and I'm like, wow, this guy, man, I don't know. I don't know about this guy. Like, I don't know if he's going to... They make it, I mean, he's here for a reason. And so, and he would just talk to his neighbor and he'd just mess around. I'd be like, hey man, like quiet down, get, get, to, get to work, man, do your work. And so it was this new prep program that they piloted out there to see how it goes and everything. I'm like, well, we'll see if he makes it, you know, because he doesn't, he don't do anything. And so I remember the last week of school, he comes up to me and he's like, hey, mister, hey, mister, guess what? And I'm like, yeah, what's up, man? He's like, I'm graduating. And I look and I'm like, are you serious? I mean, are you serious? <laughs> That's great. That's great. He's like, I'm graduating. I'm graduating. I'm so pumped. I'm like, dude, that's awesome. And in my mind, I'm thinking, how in the heck did that happen? Like, I sat here the whole year, and he didn't do anything. <laughs> he just talked to his neighbor. I think I talked to him and told him to shut up more times than anything. And um, I'm like, well, that's good, man. Uh, I'm shocked right now, but uh, I'm shocked in a good way, right? And so I said, all right, cool. And he's like, so you have to get me a present, mister. You have to get me a present. I need a gift before my graduation. I'm like, okay, what do you want, man? I'll get you anything, bro. I'm so proud of you, man. He's like, I want a hat and I want a shirt. I'm like, okay. He's like, and I want the hat to say Google graduate. (laughs) And I want the shirt to say Google degree. And I'm like, okay. He's like, they left Google open on the computers, mister. He's like, I Googled all my answers. I was like, oh my gosh. (laughs) He he graduated with Google. And, uh, and so, the, yeah, the tech department left the internet open, and he was on Google, Googling, copying and pasting, and, you know, it was multiple choice, and he got through the whole course. Uh, he probably just 70%, because he probably found 70% of the answers online, and um, graduated on Google. Unfortunately, you can't do that in life, right? You can't just Google how to fix my problems, or how to fix my marriage, or how to fix my 16-year-old teenager. Like, you can't do that on Google. And so... It's hilarious how we, we, we search and we search, and everybody's searching for answers. Everybody's searching for answers, and a lot of people are going to Google. It's, it's actually really, really shocking how many people are actually going to Google. I come from a big family, um, family of seven. My dad wanted 12 kids. Um, I don't know why you would want 12 kids. Like, I don't know why you'd want a big family like that. I guess it's just in our genes, our, our ethnicity. I don't know, it's Hispanic ethnicity. They just want a bunch of kids. And um, then the, the father works all day and the mother takes care of them, all these kids. Or maybe it's just they just didn't have nothing better to do back then. I don't know. I, I don't know. Now we're pretty busy with, with social media and stuff. But he wanted a grip of kids. And how many of you guys know if you have a big family, there's going to be a lot of words being exchanged. There's going to be a lot of fists going around the room. There's going to be a lot of kicking and pushing. And you're just going to hear a lot of chaos. And in my family, that's growing up, that's what I heard. I heard a lot of chaos going on in my family, my brothers and sisters fighting, you know, uh, belts going around, you know, uh, paddles, extension cords. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I can go on, but I don't want to because, you know. But back then, you could do that, right? Nowadays, it's like CPS and stuff. So <laughs> anyway, moving on. It's okay to spank. But anyways, um, so it was crazy in my home, and, and words were just being exchanged. And, and my dad, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but my dad was like the silent type where once he got silent, we were fighting and saying stuff. And, and, but once he got silent, he would give us that look. And right when you would look at him and he'd just be looking, and normally he is like put his hand on his, his belt, right? Um, you were going to shut up. Like he put the fear of God in you if he just looked at you the way with, with his, just, just those angry eyes like, don't, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> and that was, that was just that old school way. And, and I find myself to be a lot like my dad. I'm real silent. Like, like you'll know when I'm mad. Like I'll, I'll, I'll just... Sometimes when we're in the car and, and I'm mad and upset, I'll stay quiet. I'll just kind of mm, close in and I'm like, oh, uh, I'm gonna, and, and my kids will be fighting or something and I'll just be like, shut up, you know, shut up. And I'm kind of like the ticking time bomb, right? Silent ticking time bomb. I mean, some people, they just hold it all in. It's just like, boom, they blow up, 
right? And so, like, you just never know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm praying, all right? I'm, 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 I'm working on that. I'm praying that God would. But sometimes it's just, it boils up. I'm, that's my type of personality. I won't say much, uh, but when I say it, I'm going to say it. I'm going to bring the fire to the home, all right? Um, but that's my personality. There's some people, you know, that aren't the ticking time bomb, but I like to call them silent savages, so if you guys know what a savage is, it's kind of like a, I guess, a young te- teen term. They kind of, I mean, teens take words that have good original meanings and they twist them up and they use them for, for their own pleasure. But they took savage. And so if you could be a savage, if you're just messed up. And so teens or I mean, um, people are silent savages. So this means pretty much you just take somebody, cheap shot somebody. So you're a silent, silent type of person, but you'll throw something in there. You'll cheap shot somebody with your words, or you'll just say something that's just so, so messed up. The teens call it roasting. You'll roast on somebody. I don't know if you guys, they use the roast because usually when we think of roasting, you think of marshmallows. Teenagers use it to roast on somebody. And anyway, so you roast on somebody and you just give them one, right? You just give them one. Or maybe... Maybe, maybe you're like the passive um, savage, the passive. Like, like you're just like, oh, God bless you, sister. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. You know, she told me that, and I, I know it's unfortunate, but, well, God bless you. And you walk away, and you're like, I can't believe. I can't believe she said that to me. I can't believe she called that person. Hey, sister, how you doing? You know, you're like passive, or you dump it on somebody else, but you won't dump it to them. That's, that's passive, savage. Or maybe you are just um, a talker. You just like to talk. And it's not really good. It's not really bad. It's not really, I mean, usually you're, you know, people want to get away. They're like, oh, I've got to go now. You've been talking for an hour, you know, whatever it is. You just like to talk and talk. And that's just as your personality, right? But then you got them, the, I like to call the machine gun savages, like the vomit coming out of the mouth savages. You know what I'm talking about where you can't hold nothing back. Like you're going to say what you got to say to somebody that's either wronged you or took advantage of you or whatever it was, or you're just real quick on your toes to say something. Like you're not going to let anybody have the last word. You're just going to boom, 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 machine gun, blah, 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 and you're just going to tell them like it is. Yeah, yeah. I know some people like that, and I'm just ducking, walking away. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like they're just shots fired everywhere. You know, maybe you're that type of personality. But, but in, in all humor, I know this is, this is funny, but in reality, this is the language of our culture. Like, this is the way we communicate to one another. A lot of times, and we do it without even realizing it. Like, oh, it's not that bad. We're just saying this. We're saying that. I'm just going to blow up right here. Oh, I'm sorry. We say sorry. But, but how many of you guys want wisdom? I want wisdom in the, in the things yeah. I say because... We have this idea in our culture that we can say whatever we want, whenever we want, to whoever we want, at any time we want. That's, that's the culture that we live in. It's in our music. Like if you're listening to some of this music, it, they're telling us messages, subliminal, any, all these types of messages. Whatever they want to say, they have freedom of speech. It's in our shows that we watch. It's in our news stations. It's in our government. It's everywhere. In our culture, this is the way we communicate with one another, and then it creeps into our relationships, it creeps into our families, it creeps into our circle of friends at our jobs, and even our churches. It creeps into our churches. See, the nation calls this freedom of speech. It's your First Amendment right. And a lot of people say, I got the right. I got my First Amendment covering me. I can say whatever I want, right? And so I Googled the term freedom of speech. I Googled it. And um, It says this, it says, the right, freedom of speech is the right to express any opinion, anything you want, any opinion that you have, the right to express any opinion without censorship or restraint. I don't have to control anything I say. I don't have to censor it because this is my opinion and I have the right in the United States of America to say what I want to say whenever I want to say it. It could be on TV, on music, to someone else in the workplace. I can say it. I'm going to say it. One article says this. The author says, free speech, freedom of speech isn't really free anymore because it's costing us so much. We're paying the price for it. Our families, our relationships, our friends, we're paying the price for people that speak in this way, to speak harshly. We're all paying the price for other people's freedom of speech. God gave us this freedom to speak and this free will. 
and we've taken it just like a lot of great things and great gifts that God has given to us. We've taken them and used them for our own pleasure. We use them, we've used them to harm people, this, this gift that God has given to us. And, and we don't even realize the, the long-term consequences of what we say. Today's theme verse, we're on the subject of words of wisdom here, if you haven't noticed. Uh, Proverbs 21, 23 says, He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. He who guards his mouth and tongue guards his soul from troubles. In our culture, I, could, I think it's, it's fair enough to say that we've seen a lot of trouble because of speech, because of words that have been spoken. We've seen a lot of hurt. We've seen a lot of turmoil. We've seen a lot of trouble within our culture, within our families. This is, so, this is the opposite of the First Amendment, right? This is the opposite of free speech. And I wonder if the founding fathers ever considered this proverb, to guard what you say that, that, that it, you need a censor. You need a restraint. I wonder, they did, wonder if they ever came across this. But it's so acceptable and it's actually encouraged. Like we laugh at it. We laugh at it. We watch shows that just stir up drama. We watch shows that we, we, get, we get amused by it. Right? If you ever watched any show on Netflix or on TV, we love, the peop- we love watching people just go back and forth. We're like, what are they going to do? Oh, she, she said a lie about him. Oh, my gosh, she found out. She found out the lie. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my. And like it amuses us, right? We love it. And this is the culture. It's encouraged. We watched a video last week at Youth. No, listen, Linda. You guys remember that video? Listen, Linda. That kid's like going just, Linda, listen. Linda, this little boy, like, oh, what, do we, what you got to say? Go ahead and say it. You're four years old and say whatever you want, right? Like, Linda should have been like, hey, I'm going to get the belt. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> moving on, moving on. I want to give you guys some, some words that describe the language of our culture, okay? This is the wisdom's world. This is the world that we live in, the, 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 the wisdom of the world. And the first set of words in the language of our culture are the words of division. I'm going to expose some things. The words of division, Proverbs 16, 28 says, a perverse man spreads strife and a slanderer separates intimate friends. These are words that separate. These are words that cause disunity. These are are words that cause um, separation between friends and family and, and, and people in our culture, people in our world. Words that provoke arguments. Words that stir up the drama to, with the intent of just separating. That's, that's, that's the result of it. These are words of hate that cause separation. These are words that hurt people and cause people to, to uh, isolate themselves from you and from other people. That's the result of these type of words. This is the drama, right? Some people love the drama. And these are words that cause and initiate drama. Even words of complaint. I mean, you don't think complaining is a, is a big deal, but complaining, it's, a, it's, it's another word, a biblical term is contention, where you're just complaining, you're just getting that, and you're just, ugh, I'm going to say something, I'm going to be the squeaky wheel, I'm going to get my way. But in the end, what happens is you separated yourself from people and from people that you love. Words of retaliation, uh, you told me this, you said something to me, I'm going to say it back, I'm going to have the last word. A matter of fact, I'm going to say this just to hurt you because you said it to me. And what happens is we cause, we cause a disunity. Words of gossip. Words of gossip. Over here, we, have a no, we are discovering no gossip tolerance here because it's, it's caused so much harm in the church. It causes so much harm in the workplace, in your family. Anywhere you go, when you talk about somebody else and never say it to them, it's gossip and it hurts and it separates people. So words of division, words of slander, just bad-mouthing people, hating on people. I just want to say real quick, too, as we, before we, we move on, when you text somebody or when you post something on, when we, when we post something on Facebook or Twitter, it's the same thing as saying it. It's actually even worse because you're not, not saying it to that person. And so we got to be careful in even the things that we text and the things that we, we Facebook and the things that we tweet online because it's the same, sometimes even worse. The truth is, is this, is that words of division only cause your own separation. Words of division only cause your own, they cause you to be separate yourself. People who divide find themselves alone. They find themselves alone because, they, because of the words of division, they separated themselves 
from people. And people, most people don't want to be around somebody who gossips, who, who spreads division, who causes discourse, who's, you just know what they're going to do. So you're just going to, and a lot of people that cause division find themselves alone, separate from people they love. Because what you speak is what you'll experience. You speak division, you'll experience division in your own life. Second set of words is this in the language of our culture are the words of dishonesty. Words of dishonesty. Proverbs 26, 28 says this. It says, a lying tongue hates, a highlighted hates. A lying tongue hates those it crushes. Whenever we lie to somebody, Proverbs of Solomon is saying, we hate that person and we crush them with our lies. We crush their spirits when we lie, when we deceive them. These are the words of lies. These are the words of deception. The second half of that verse says, and a flattery mouth works ruins. You're just working. You're manipulating. You're working ruin in your life and in that person's life. These are words of fabrication. We like to call them rumors, right? Spreading rumors about people, things that are not even true, that come out of our mouth. Words of exaggeration, Words of God, it's not the truth. I'm just stretching the truth a little bit. I'm just stretching it. It's, that's a lie. That's not the truth. There's a show called Pretty Little Liars. I don't know if you guys have heard of that show. It's on Netflix. You ain't pretty when you lie, girl. Stop lying, all right? You're not pretty. Liar. This is a popular show. Apparently, they love to watch it. They love to watch it. Words of, of lies, words that make assumptions about someone without having the truth. When we speak these things, we're speaking lies to somebody else because we assume something, but it's not the truth. And we spread lies and rumors because of what we assume about people. Words of manipulation, words of trickery, right? Manipulating somebody, trying to get in there and be slick and sly to get your way. Those are words of deception, where we deceive people, thinking, having them think something, but then in the end, we just, we're just in it for what we want. That's, those are words of manipulation in an effort to get our way. See, the truth is that the words of dishonesty discredit those who speak them. The words of dishonesty discredit those who speak them. They will never be trusted, and they will always find it difficult to trust others, because what you speak is what you experience and if you're lying to people and deceiving people, you're always going to be thinking that somebody's going to be lying to you and deceiving you. Therefore, you're not going to trust anybody, and no one's really going to trust you because they know you're a liar and a deceiver. So what you speak is what you experience. Third set of words is this, in the language of our culture, are the words of discouragement. The words of discouragement. These are words that depress, words that disappoint, words that cause distress, Words that just bring people down. Proverbs 15, 4 says, A pervasive tongue, speaking words that overwhelm and depress, crushes the spirit. I don't think we realize how much we crush people with just discouragement. And these are the words that degrade, the words that devalue, the, the words that speak harshly. Some of the music we listen to, man, it's all about devaluing somebody, devaluing women, right? degrading women, devaluing the man's role in the home. Like it's, it's discouragement and we take it in and we listen to it. These are the words that speak harshly of one another, name calling and bashing people. I don't think we realize how that sets root in our hearts and then we hold on to that. You'll never amount to anything. You're just like your father, not in a good way. You're just like your mother, not in a good way. You'll never amount to anything. Who told you you could do that? You can't do that. Those are words that just discourage. Maybe it's words of sarcasm. And I know we, I know I was kind of cautious to put this in there, but when I read the, the definition, I saw the Greek prefix for sarx. It means to tear. It means to tear flesh, like to tear something apart. And, and the, the, the actual definition of sarcasm is irony intended to insult somebody. Like the intention is to insult you with sarcasm. And sometimes it's fun and games. You know how they say it's all fun and games so somebody gets hurt, you know? And I find that to be true in, in people that are sarcastic with other people. Somebody gets hurt. Those words penetrate. They take root. 
It's the words of sarcasm. Be careful. Be very careful on what you say. Sometimes we do this without realizing, and, and so many friends, so many of our friends and family members and, and those we love are hurt, and they're limited, and they're hindered because of our words, because of our discouraging words. And these words, they actually rob countless men and women and children of their God-given purpose because they've been limited, they've been capped down. I found that people who discourage others are miserable, they're depressed, and they're unhappy with their own, their own lives. They're unhappy with their own selves. And that's their reality, so they experience it, so they speak it to others. I'm unhappy, I'm discouraged, something, well, I'm, I'm going to do the same to you, because that's what I speak, and that's, what I, that's my reality, that's what I experience. Solomon says this, Proverbs 18, 7, a fool's mouth is his own destruction. A fool's mouth is his own destruction. And then he says, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Our mouths are the trap for our own destruction. But we say we, we only just trap ourselves and destroy ourselves with the words that we speak to others. And we have the power to set ourselves up to be the most miserable people on the planet. We have that power just by the words we speak. And the things that we speak and the things are, are the things that we experience. So if we speak division and we speak dishonesty and we, we speak discouragement, then we experience those things. I remember, man, my, my family, we would sit, we sit and when we get together and we talk about, um, we talk about how mom and dad, you know, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, but we talk about like the spankings that we got and we talk about when mom did this or dad did this and man, that hurts so bad. And remember when we got that whipping, remember when, remember when like my dad was, was, he would like, he would spank us, but he would, he would uh, explain to us what he's going to do. How many know that's worse? <laughs> like, it's like, okay, you stole something. So um, what I want you to do is sit right there and sit down. It's like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to spank you. I'm going to get you to get up. I'm going to spank you with this belt because this is what you did. And, and as a kid, you're just like, oh, you're just boiling up inside your soul. And, and the anticipation of it all. And then he would make us get up and he would explain to us what he's going to do. And then boom. And we, we always talk about this and we laugh. Remember when mom did this? We talk. But you know what we don't talk about and what we're not so, what's not so humorous is some of the words that were spoken to us as kids or some of the words that should have been spoken to us that weren't spoken to us by our family members and our parents. Like, that's not so funny. Because studies have shown that's, that verbal abuse is as equal or even more detrimental to a person than physical abuse. That those things that you say, they, they hold more weight for a lifetime, for a longer time than a physical spank or whatever it is. We can laugh about that, but those words, they stick. It doesn't go away easily. It's not temporary. They stay with you. One psychologist calls it the unseen wounds, the unseen wounds that we have that no one can see. And there's a poem that says, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie, okay? That's a lie because words do hurt. And words do stick, and they stay, and they mess with our minds, they mess with our lives, they mess with us. This is the power of the tongue. James says it like this in James chapter 3, verse 3 to 5. He says, a bit in the mouth, in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest wind. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account. It may not be a big deal. A word out of my mouth, it may be of no account. It's not that big of a deal. And James says, no, it can accomplish nearly anything or it can destroy it. That's some powerful stuff right there. It can accomplish this, this big horse, this little bit in the mouth of the horse. If you guys know anything about horses, can move this horse to the right, to the left, can make him stop, can make him jump, can make this huge horse move its whole body just by this little bit in his mouth. Same thing with the ship, this huge ship. This little rudder on the bottom turns it in which direction it wants it to go. That's the power of the tongue. In here, that's the power that we have been given. That's the power we have been given. Your mouth, your mouth has the power to do two things, and I want you to write this in. It's in Proverbs 18, 20, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. 
As a matter of fact, to get really mind blown here, and I, I was, I was, when I was preparing for this, God showed me. To get really mind blown is that in the book of Genesis, God actually spoke the universe into existence by the power of his word. God said, let there be, and there was. That's mind blowing to me. That's, that's mind boggling to me that God would speak and it was. And I'll make the biblical claim today that we were made in the image of God and that God has given us the same power and the same, the same words to speak life and to speak, uh, uh, to, to build up what, what, what we want in people, right? In people, in our prayer life, in our lives. God has given us that power. It's the power of the tongue. God breathed life by the power of his word. He breathed life. There's power in our words. So today we can choose to speak death, the language of our culture. We can choose that, or we can choose to speak life through the wisdom that only comes from God. We can choose that. How do I learn the words of wisdom? How do I learn the words of wisdom that come from heaven? Since God has given us this, this freedom of speech, then we have the ability to choose. We have the ability to respond on our own free will. We can choose this. It's not something that we can, we just say, oh, it happens. We can choose today. We can decide what we say. The direction, we can decide the direction in which the ship sails. We can, we can decide today where we're leading our families, where we're leading our friends, where we're leading the world around us. We can decide that today. And it all starts with this declaration, it starts with this decision. I want you to fill this in. Today, I choose to be a tree of life. I choose to be a tree of life. Proverbs 15, 4 says this. It says, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Another tr other translations say, a gentle tongue, a soothing tongue, a life-giving tongue, a tongue that heals is a tree of life. The biblical, uh, the Bible uh, symbolizes fruit as being the words that come from our mouths. They come from this tree. And if you think of a tree, if you imagine a tree, you think of nice, fresh, attractive fruit from this tree that we give out, that, we're, that we were intended to give out. And these are the fruits that God intended us to give. Today, we can be a tree that bears good fruit. We can be a tree that bears life-giving words, health to our body, soul, and mind. We can choose that, words that God intended us to speak. Today, we can choose that. And we're going to focus on three fruits. These are the fruits of wisdom. How many of you guys want change in your culture? How many of you guys want change in your families? How many want change in your marriages? Yes, I want change in my, in my marriage. This is where it starts right here. It starts with choosing the fruits from this tree of life that God has given us. And he said, you can make a decision to change this by the words you speak. So today we choose, the number one is we choose the fruit of encouragement. We choose the fruit of encouragement. On this tree, we see this fruit and it's encouragement. Proverbs 12, 18 says this. It says, there is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing, restoration. That's what, that's what the tongue of the wise brings. Because the world can be a cruel place. It can be a cruel place. There's people that bash and people that, that say things and people that degrade and devalue can be a cruel place for us. I remember when my youngest son started going to school, and we were really nervous that he was going because school system is sometimes it's crazy. And sometimes you have kids that have been taught to just say whatever they want to say, you know, holding back. They're never taught. And, and my youngest son, Johnny, he's, he's, he's a special kid. He was born with a hand anomaly. He was born on his right hand. He was born with two fingers. And, um, and it was totally unexpected. My wife, you know, and I were just like, what happened? We didn't see that in the ultrasound. And, and um, I remember the first day he went to preschool. And he was a baby. He didn't realize it. He'd pick up Cheerios and, you know, he didn't, he didn't know. But the first day he went to preschool, he came back home and he was eating. I remember it so clear. Um, he said, Mom and Dad, I don't want this hand anymore. He said, I don't want this. This is how his hand is. And Johnny's awesome. He said, I want this hand to be on this hand. I want this one on here. This is what I want. And immediately we knew that somebody said something to him discouraging Somebody says something about his hand, and we pulled him aside. We said, look, you know what? This is the hand. This is how God created you, and he created you to do anything you want to do, okay? 
When you hear stuff like that from people, you shake it off and you know that you are God's child. And we begin to speak life in him. We begin to build him up. And I, my wife and I talked about that after that. We made a pact to say, we're going to encourage the heck out of this kid. We're going to speak life into him because he's going he's gonna to encounter these, these times more often in school. But we're going to speak so much life into him that he's going to walk in confidence. And if you know Johnny, he's a confident kid, man. Like, he'll just jump in the crowd. He'll jump and just play with. He'll talk. He's outgoing. He's confident because we're, we're speaking life into him. We're telling him, hey, you can do anything that, that you want to do in, in the power and the strength of Jesus, that you were created for greater things. You were created for purpose. So today, we choose to speak life. We choose to speak those things that, that aren't as if they were. That's what we choose. We choose to be optimistic. Words of negativity, we, we kick them out and we be positive about stuff because that's going to change your perspective. It's going to change the atmosphere that you're around. When you speak those things, you choose to declare the goodness of God, choose to declare the purpose of God rather than the failures and the mistakes in your life and in the lives of others. Encourage somebody. I challenge you guys, encourage somebody today. Build somebody up today. Do it on Facebook. Do it through a text. Do it in person. Watch how the world changes when you encourage people, when you affirm people. Speak life and build someone up to their full potential. Tell your kids what they can be rather than how they perform and how they act. Why don't you tell them how they can be? This is how you can be. This is who you are. You're not like that. You're not the statistic. You are better than that. Speak life into them. Replace the can't with you can because of who God is. And replace the I'm not with the I am because of who God created me to be. Let's replace our words with words of encouragement. Choose encouragement today. Choose encouragement. Proverbs, I think I was missing one here. We'll move on. Choose the fruit of encouragement. Number two is this. Choose the fruit of restraint. Choose the fruit of restraint. This one's, this one's tough. This is a fruit, though. It's a fruit. Self-control. Proverbs 10, 19 says this. It says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. 29, 11 says, fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. Listen, not everything you feel needs to be said. Not everything you feel needs to be said. Just because you think it doesn't mean you have to say it. And many times we speak out of impulse or we speak out of anger or we speak out of frustration. And then in the end, we end up hurting someone. And then we're like, man, I regret what I said. Why did I say that? And you may, you may say, it's just the way I am. It's just so hard. My parents were loud. It's my... It's my race. I don't know, you know, whatever you want to say, but it's in reality, it's just a lack of discipline, a lack of self-control. And the proverb says, choose to restrain what you say. Sometimes we speak so much that can, we can never hear what God has to say to us because we just keep talking and we just say something and instead of just holding back quietly and saying, God, what are you teaching me here right now? Because I want to say so much, but what are you trying to tell me? But God can never tell us something if we're talking too much, right? And then sometimes we talk to our kids, they're like, shut up, I'm trying to talk to you, listen to me, listen to me, I'm trying to say something to you. And sometimes I feel like the Lord is like, I'm trying to tell you something, but you keep talking, stop. We must choose to guard our mouths. A guard stands in front of a door and he says, you're, you're not coming in, you're not coming out. And sometimes we need to do that with our words. That's not going to be beneficial to anybody. That's not going to build anybody. That's not even necessary. This is the wrong time to say that, and it's the wrong place to say that. So we, we got to choose to learn how to bite our tongues, and I know it's hard. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying internalize everything and just, you know, build it up and then um, blow up like a ticking time bomb, you know, Lord help me. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. This is what I am saying, though. I'm saying to stop, be disciplined, and give it to God. Let God be your vindicator. Let God be your mouthpiece. Give, give the whole uh, revenge to God. It's his. And just, and just, he'll speak on your behalf. He really will speak on your behalf. 
and just give it to him. Say, Lord, I want to say this, but, but I know it's not the best thing. I'm angry right now. I'm going to say this, but I'm going to be quiet, and I'm going to give it to you, and you're going to speak for me. If you speak anything, speak truth and love and sprinkle it with grace and stand up for what's right. This includes in social media and through text messaging. The key is to listen more than you speak. Listen more than you speak. And when you do speak, choose the fruit of encouragement. Number three is this. Number three is we choose the fruit of godly counsel. The fruit of godly counsel. Proverbs 27, 9 says this. Listen to counsel and accept instruction that you may be wise the rest of your life. The rest of your days. What would happen if we received and gave advice, guidance, and counsel from the wisdom of God's word? What would happen if we sat with our families and our children and our coworkers and said, you know what, I, this is what I believe and I'm going to take it from God's word. What would happen if we, if we raised our, our families and led them with the, the counsel and the advice and the principles of God's word? If we fixed our marriage not on some book that somebody wrote, but our marriage is on the word of God. Like, what if we taught godly principles every chance we got in our schools, in the workplace? Like, these are the principles that, that, that mean something, that matter, that are eternal. What if we did that? Proverbs 10, 21, this is not in your notes, but it says this. It says, the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. What if we fed people good fruit, nutrition, life? What if we fed people that stuff? We don't need to look to the world's wisdom We don't need the next self-help book. We don't need new age philosophy and new age thinking to fix our problems. We don't need Dr. Phil. How about that? How about that? She should have got spanked. I'm sorry. I'm on this whole spanking thing. (laughs) But don't you feel like that? You're like, this kid gets spanked. What? Mom. Anyways, we, we don't need that because it comes from God's word. We don't need outside sources to, to help us fix Our marriages and raise our teens, we need the word of God and the counsel. We need to accept advice and counsel. We need to receive advice and counsel, and we need to give it to those who need it from God's word. Today, we choose to receive the counsel. We choose the the, the fruit of of godly wisdom and godly counsel from his word, from God's word. When I think of of, um, the tree, we've been talking about this tree giving off this, this fruit and this attractive fruit and this good stuff, man. I I, I think about this tree wouldn't be anything nice or beautiful if it didn't have a core. You, know, you got to go deeper within the tree because it all looks nice and this is all, this is all great stuff and I want to choose this, but there's something deeper in the core of the tree that needs to happen or needs to take place. And I, let, I begin to think about the tree and its root system, the tree and it's, it's the under, what's happening under the soil because whatever's happening under the soil in this tree, uh, it's a result of what's happening over the soil and above the soil and the tree. And really, a tree and its fruit is only as good as the roots planted deep in the soil. If the roots are bad, then the tree's bad. If the roots are good, the tree is good. Jesus says this, and this is the heart of the the issue here. He says this in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And we can, we can see this tree and want this tree, but man, it starts right here because your tongue and your words are only as good as what is stored deep within your heart. We can want this, but it starts right here in our heart. Jesus is saying here that everything we speak is a result of what's in here because this is where it starts. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And if we store bitterness And if we store unforgiveness, and if we store hate and store hurt, then we'll speak division, and we'll speak discouragement, and we'll speak dishonesty, because it's coming from what is stored in our heart. But if gentleness and joy and love is stored up in our hearts, then we speak life. If, If the life of God is stored within our hearts, we speak encouragement, and we speak godly counsel, because our tongue reveals our heart. Your tongue reveals your heart. So the question is this, is our heart healthy today? Is your heart healthy? What are we storing up in our hearts? 
What are, we, what are we harboring in our hearts that's making its way up and it's coming out in the form of words that are being spoken to our families and to our culture? What are those things that are coming out? Maybe, maybe it's hurt. Maybe it's the hurt that you've experienced has caused you to lash out on other people and hurt other people. Or, or maybe it's insecurity. We've harbored insecurity so it causes us to, to provoke arguments, or it's caused us to gossip, or it's caused us to make, us, make ourselves feel better to, and hurt somebody else to make ourselves feel better. Or maybe it's pride. We've harbored pride, and we're, not, we're, we're prideful. We have a hard heart, but we've said some hurtful words because of it to our kids, and we've separated our families because of our pride that we've harbored, that's stored up in our hearts. God wants to place a new heart in you today. He wants to place a new heart in us. He wants to give us his heart so that we can speak his words. He wants to give us his heart. He wants to give us a fresh start today. If you desire to be that tree of life, this is the last filling in your notes. We must first choose to surrender our hearts. Choose to surrender your heart this morning. Choose to say, God, here is my heart because it all starts here. I need a new heart. I need a, a heart transplant. Because in order for God to do something through me, he must first do something in me. In order, in, order for me in order for me to speak words of life, he must do something in my heart. He must deposit life into me. In order for my words to bring healing and health, our hearts must be full of the love of God. In order to give love, we must receive love. And that love is available to us today. I want everybody to bow your heads this morning. Every eye closed, 